Now the government and the licensed producers are looking to keep prohibition in place, maintain the policing budgets, allow a few select people to grow it and produce it legally, but they won't ever be able to meet the needs of the medical users or the recreational users. That is Jody Emery, of course, from Cannabis Culture. She's one of the activists. She's been arrested recently. On Thursday, the federal government will table legislation to legalize marijuana. What will be in it? What are people looking for? One of the other big activists in this movement who is concerned about what will be in this legislation and how the provinces will enact it, what will be the age, who will distribute, who will be able to grow. Those are some critical questions. And Dana Larson, he's the director of Overgrow Canada, director of Sensible BC, and Dana has been a frequent guest on our program, and he's back with us again. Hi, Dana. Hey, hello. Thanks for having me. Well, Dana, it's always good to have you, sir. What are your concerns about the legislation that comes out on Thursday? Well, my biggest concern is that I expect arrests to continue on Friday, and after this legislation is passed, I can expect arrests for possession and personal cultivation and other minor cannabis offenses to continue for several years to come. And if they don't stop arrests, then it's not really legalization, is it? Well, they're going to arrest. I mean, I, and I've spoken to Bill Blair about this. And basically, they say it's quite simple. It's illegal until it's legal. So we don't want activists to pretend and to think or to convince themselves that we have legalized anything until we have. Right now, the law is the law. We will enforce it when we when we do. And I, I, I agree with you that they're enforcing it inconsistently, but it will be legal. Is that, do you think that's the wrong response? Well, saying the law is the law. Yeah, we want them to change the law now to stop arresting people with a couple of plants or a few grams in their pocket. We just had a case in Alberta uh, today or yesterday where a woman was charged for cultivation of one cannabis plant. And it's a huge waste of police resources. No one's going to be confused by by what's going on if they say we're going to stop arresting people for possession of, say, 30 grams or less, and they've been talking about four plants or less. Why can't you start that now? What, what's the logic of continuing to criminalize people for something which we've decided as a society should not be a crime? Uh, that that's really bothering me. And the fact that these arrests are probably going to continue for several years to come, you know, from minor cannabis offenses, uh, that just makes no sense at all to me. It's illegal till it's legal. So change the law and fix it. Well, they're trying to. Their, their point is that it's going to take uh, time and that the provinces are going to, they're going to table legislation, much like they did with physician assisted death. And then the provinces are going to figure it out. Right. So in the meantime, do we need to keep arresting people every day for possession of cannabis? So you think, I don't de- think so. do you think they should decriminalize immediately? Like it's a two-step process like the NDP are saying? Yes, absolutely. They should have decriminalized on day one. You know, when Trudeau confessed that he had smoked cannabis, we didn't care. We elected him prime minister. But if we get caught smoking cannabis, we still get charged and punished. Bill Blair has been explicit that these cannabis charges target the most vulnerable people. They target First Nations, poor people, young people. I'm a white middle-class guy in Vancouver. I can mail pot to my to prime minister. Nothing happens to me, which I've done. But other Canadians who get caught with a few grams in their pocket gets, get charged because they live in the north or they live in a small community where the police have a different attitude. That kind of insist, in, uh, inconsistent policing I don't think should be acceptable to Canadians. Do you think, by the way, and a senior liberal told me, one of the reasons that their liberals are thinking about doing this is that marijuana has always been legal for white people. And the the expression wasn't exact, but the description was, you know what, if you're First Nations or you're not white, you're going to get busted and you're going to get put in the slammer. If you're white and you're busted with pot, well, quite likely the cops will just kind of turn a blind eye. Is Is, is there a disproportionate number of um, people of color, as it were, who are arrested for marijuana? Well, it certainly seems that way. You know, the police don't keep racial statistics on their arrests. But what we do see in Canada is that the further north you go in Canada, there are drastically higher rates of charges for possession and small-scale trafficking than there are in the, in the southern parts of Canada. And I think that's definitely partially because those are just smaller, more rural communities where the law is typically enforced more strictly than in big cities. And it's partly because those areas have a much larger First Nations population. The arrest rates in Nunavut are like 100 times higher than in Vancouver for these things. And, and that just really is unfair. And the people that are being charged are the ones that can least afford to deal with these kind of charges in their lives. 
Speaking of Dana Larson, uh, I'm going to read a quote that you wrote. I'd be happy to talk to ask Norman Inkster or any of the other police how they feel about having spent their careers persecuting cannabis users, including medical users, and now they seek profit off those same people. What do you talk? Can you tell me exactly um, who you're talking about and why you believe uh, what that's all about? Well, the, the, under the conservatives and now the liberals, we've got this program of licensed producers. And there's about 40 companies that have been licensed to grow marijuana, to sell medically. But there's hundreds and hundreds of companies that have applied, that have spent millions of dollars each, and that have ultimately not even got an answer. And, and they, can't, they can't get in this business because they won't get an answer from Health Canada. They won't get licensed. And the ones that are being licensed are the ones who have political connections, who have Liberal Party connections, who have police connections. And they're so just in- like Norman Inkster is a former head of the RCMP. That's right. He's a former head of the RCMP. Now he's working with Metrum, the, the licensed producer that was caught spraying poison on their plants and is facing class action lawsuits from patients. And the idea that these police officers, you know, Norman Inkster never once in his career uh, said, oh, I think marijuana should be legal or oh, I think medical marijuana should be looked at. And virtually none of these politicians or policemen that are getting involved in these licensed producer companies did anything to help end cannabis prohibition when they had a chance in power. In fact, they oppressed cannabis users and cannabis growers. And so I don't want to buy my cannabis from people that were making their living, arresting my friends and and the cannabis culture just a few years ago. Those people should not be the front of the line when it comes to who gets to sell and grow cannabis. Incredible. So now there's other examples um, here. Mike Harcourt, chairman of True Leaf Medicine, former BC premier. Herb Dollywell, uh, he's part of the National Green Biomed, former MP and cabinet minister, a liberal cabinet minister. Uh, John Turner, the former prime minister. I mean, they're, like it's incredible the the political connection. Senator Larry Campbell, former uh, Van, you know um, RCMP officer, Vancouver mayor, sitting senator. Like it's incredible the amount of people involved in the pot industry. It, it's. I don't think most Canadians realize how many politicians have been getting involved in this, and and these companies they seek political credibility because they I guess apparently need those kind of connections to get their permits happening. And this is going to be a big problem with this proposed legalization because unlike alcohol, which is determined at the provincial level who gets to brew alcohol, licenses are given out provincially. But with cannabis, the federal government wants to keep sole power on who can grow and sell cannabis, and the provinces can figure out how it's going to be sold and where it's going to be sold. But those licenses are like gold. And, and the idea that they're, they're going to restrict these licenses to their political friends, I think, is very disturbing to a lot of Canadians. There should not be 40 licensed producers. There should be 4,000 licensed producers across Canada by now to meet the national demand for cannabis. These 40 companies can't even meet the tiny fraction of the medical market that is coming their way. And, and I think they've kind of created a monster because some of these companies like Canopy, which actually owns four different LPs, they're a billion and a half dollar company. And if, if the Trudeau, Trudeau were to announce tomorrow that he's going to license 400 new LPs, Canopy stock value would drop drastically. It would be heavily diluted. And so I think they've kind of created a situation here where they're going to cause a lot of financial harm to Canadians when they open up the, the market because all this investment money is going to disappear. I'm speaking with Dana Larson. This is a big deal because, and again, the list that I'm reading from has is, is been making its way online. We're trying to verify all those names, just to be clear. Uh, but I think, though, you know, as far as we know, that that's what we know. We'll, we'll keep verifying. But the political contacts in the in the this is like the Klondike gold rush. And I guess you wonder if people like you and the Emery's, the people who have been basically getting arrested, those people who have been pioneering this in the end, you're on the razor's edge, the early adopters and you get cut. And these guys all come in and make a boatload of money. Yeah, I mean, let's be clear. I'm not interested in this because I want to sell cannabis or I want to get rich off of, off of legalizing marijuana. That's not my goal. I don't really care if I personally can sell cannabis or not. That's not really what I want to be doing. But what I do want to see an open market. I do want to see a situation where regular Canadians can get involved. In Oakland, in California, they actually created a system where if you've been victimized by cannabis prohibition, it's easier for you to get a license to participate in the market to help make up for the damage that's been done. 
And I guess really what just bothers me is that how all this focus is on who's going to make money, who's going to cash in, how much their stock value is worth. But to me, it's a human rights issue. We should be focusing on who's still getting arrested, who's still in jail, who's still being punished for this non-crime of growing or sharing cannabis. Right. And arguing about all this money when people are still being arrested for one plant in Canada, that's backwards priorities to me. Dana, we'll speak to you on Thursday when we get this legislation table. The details matter. The details matter enormously. And then, of course, this phase two will be what the provinces talk about. But Dana Larson, Director of Overgrow Cannabis, Cannabis, uh, Canada, rather, and Director of Sensible BC. Dana, I I hope we can talk Thursday after you get a chance to read this legislation, because this is a big, big story. Thanks, Dana. Thank you very much for having me. Always appreciate your perspective. He's very, very uh, involved in this and very smart. And I think that story, as Chris Sims, you've spoken about and written about the story of the number of former political people, former cops who are now trying to get involved in the or are involved in the marijuana industry. And again, let me just say, first of all, they are doing nothing wrong. They're doing nothing illegal. They are. I don't want to cast aspersions. It's not like by doing this, maybe they just were following the law and they're trying to do their own thing. But it is extraordinary to point out, isn't it? It really is. I think your gold rush analogy is spot on.